Good morning, afternoon, and everyone from Geneva to everybody, and welcome to the second episode of ITU Satellite Webinars. My name is Jorge Sicorosi. I'm a senior engineer from the Space Services Department here at the ITU. A few weeks ago, uh, most of you participated in the first episode of the ITU Satellite Webinars that we dedicated to preventing interference to satellite systems. Our finding analytics, analytics indicated that more than 1,500 participants from 121 countries have participated through different means, either the Zoom platform or from the ITU web or YouTube. We are expecting the similar uh, similar forecast for this uh, episode two of ITU, ITU webinars or even more. So uh, in fact, believe or not, either you are working from home or from the office, certainly you are not going to be alone in the next two hours. So today we are dedicating this episode to, to NG Solar's constellation, which are for broadband applications. And we'll count with the presence of the VR director, Mr. Mario Maniewicz, the chief of the space services department, Mr. Alexander Vallet, and experts and executives from the, I would say, the big five NGSO of today. Before going in, in these deep discussions uh, and giving the floor to Mr. Maniewicz, I will give you just a few um, practical announcement, let's say. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and webcasted through the ITU website, and uh, the video and the presentations will be posted in the event website and YouTube after the meeting. That will be for further consultations. And finally, uh, let me tell you that we have uh, just designed three polls with basic, basic three questions, which we think is uh, relevant to get your views, your insights of, of this field, and we'll share these results at the end of the uh, webinar. So now let me give the floor to Mr. Mario Maniewicz, the director of the Radio Communication Bureau. Director. Yes, uh, thank you, Jorge. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to our distinguished speakers first, but also to all the participants who are joining this ITUR webinar from around the world. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this second episode in the series of ITU satellite webinars. As you heard a few weeks ago, we hosted the first one dedicated to preventing interface interference to satellite systems, where we counted with distinguished speaker from the space sector and an impressive audience of 1,500 participants who connected over the different media platforms from 121 countries. Today's webinar is dedicated to non-GSO satellite constellations that are already operating, providing broadband communications or are about to do so. Almost one year after WRC 19, during which intensive deliberations on the regulatory framework for such systems took place, I'm glad to see that the work of the conference will assist in providing more legal certainty for the operation of these projects. As you well know, the conference took a number of decisions in order to create a stable regulatory framework for the deployment of large non-GSO constellations, not only in the traditional KU and KA bands, but also in higher frequency bands, or bands around 40 and 50 gigahertz, taking benefits of the latest advances in space technologies. An exhaustive technical regulatory mechanism was also put in place to protect other terrestrial and satellite systems sharing the same frequency bands and to ensure the compatibility between them, making an efficient use of the spectrum with the global frequency harmonization required by these non-GSO constellations, while benefiting of the consequent economies of scale that are gradually growing in this field as well. The Radio Communication Bureau is aware not only of the long-term efforts required in the coordination and deployment of satellite systems, but also on the benefit for the society and the key role they are playing to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is why it is very appropriate that we organize this webinar during the World Space Week, which uh, theme this year is Satellites Improve Life. You will discover many examples today. In this context, and counting with more than 50 years of experience in space regulations, the Radio Communication Bureau reiterates its commitment to provide all necessary technical regulatory assistance to the ITU member, members through its Space Services Department, which is laid, led by Mr. Ale Alexander Vallet, who is moderating the webinar today. Dear friends, we are proud to count on distinguished experts and organizations supporting these webinars, 
and a new as a valuable audience. Once again, I invite you to enjoy the webinar, participate actively in it, and more importantly, to apply the concepts that you will learn to enable the development of this fascinating field of satellite communications. Together, we can make reality our dream of bringing broadband connectivity to every corner of the world. Have a nice webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Director. And um, welcome to all the participants to this uh, second episode dedicated today to a non-GSO uh, satellite system, and in fact, to non-GSO satellite systems uh, that are going to provide uh, uh, broadband services. Um, I'm Alexandre Vallée, the Chief of the Space Services Department in uh, the ITUBR. And uh, the, um, I will start this webinar with a brief reminder of what the last uh, the World Radio Conference, WRC19, um, decided on this uh, field. So you can see that um, WRC19 uh, took two main decisions. The first one is to set up a new regulatory framework, or an improved regulatory framework, I should say, for an GSO and non-GSO satellites in the 50-40 gigahertz range. The second one uh, is the creation of a milestone-based deployment process that is aimed at avoiding spectrum warehousing by li large non-GSO filings. Let me explain a little bit more. The first main achievement was about creating a regulatory framework that is both sustainable and I, we hope equitable uh, for sharing between uh, GSO and non-GSO satellite system. So this uh, new framework apply in the 50-40 gigahertz range, that is to say between 37.5 and 51.1 gigahertz. And it is comprised of three main elements. Uh, the sharing between the GSO, FSS, BSS, and MSS systems and non gen GSO, FSS systems is based on the adoption of two limits, so two technical limits. One, which is a single entry limit uh, of uh, 3% of degradation into a set of uh, GSO reference links. And um, the second one, which is an aggregate limit of 10% or 8%, depending on the case, to protect a set of GSO links together with uh, more operational links. So you can see that the aim of the conference was to uh, establish the sharing between GSO and non-GSO based on technical conditions, a priori technical conditions. On the counterpart, the conference established uh, the sharing mechanism between or among the non-GSO FSS and MSS systems by relying on the usual ITU coordination process. So for uh, among non-GSO systems, there will be a more, uh, it will be more based on discussion among actors. Of course, the sharing between GSO systems will continue to be based on the same ITU usual coordination process. And these three elements allows to uh, provide a complete framework for uh, the, uh, uh, the two main components of the satellite system, GSO and non-GSO. This um, was complemented by a second achievement, which was um, a process to monitor the deployment of non-GSO large constellation. Uh, as you may know, when you want to use a frequency uh, in space, you have to register it uh, with ITU. And to do that, you send what is called an ITU satellite filing. This ITU satellite filing uh, contains the uh, details of what uh, you plan to operate. And you have to bring into use this filing within seven years uh, from the start of your uh, uh, request. This seven year limit is aimed at preventing um, a request to uh, hold forever. The, what WRC19 decided was give a clear definition to the concept of bringing to use. 
For example, for a GSO system, uh, bringing into use a GSO systems is quite obvious. You have to put a GSO satellite uh, to bring into use the system. But for a non-GSO constellation, what does it mean? Do you have to deploy the entire constellation or just a part of it, just one? And this is all the discussion and all the solutions that were provided by uh, WRC-19. So WRC-19 decided two things. First, the bring into use, the first point, is to be done with at least one satellite. And uh, this satellite has to be operated in one notified orbital plane for at least 90 days. The, of course, this is not enough to keep your filing alive, your rights alive. You, you have to continue the deployment as a, at a steady pace. And this pace was decided also by the WRC-19. And it says that you have to deploy at least 10% of your constellation within two years after the end of the seven-year period, then 50% within five years, and then you have to complete deployment by seven years. So you have 14 years to complete your deployment, and uh, you have to meet the, the two intermediate milestones. An important point is that the penalty, if you not met, if you not meet, if you don't meet the milestone, is not a complete loss of all your right, but simply a reduction of your rights proportional to what you have deployed. So let's take an example. You have a file in ITU for a constellation of 100 satellites. You are able, after seven years, to bring into use one. So you keep your filing of 100 satellites. Then after uh, two years, plus uh, after the seven year, you deploy 10 satellites. So you meet the 10%. So you keep your filing as it is. But then, unfortunately, within five years after the seven year period, you are only able to deploy 40. So in fact, you have not met the 50% uh, milestone. Well, you don't lose everything. What you lose is the difference between what you have done and what you should have done. So basically, what you are uh, allowed now is to deploy only 80 satellites. That is to say, twice the number that you uh, have deployed at milestone two. And the reason for that is that if you have met milestone two, that is to say 50, then you have also the right to, 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 put, to put in orbit twi twice the number of satellites. That would be the complete constellation. So the idea is to simply scale down your rights to what uh, uh, co corresponding to the efforts you have made. Um, the, this process of milestones, it applies to FSS, MSS, and BSS systems in some frequency bands, many KU, K, and QV bands. And uh, it, will, it has formally legally entered into force at the end of the conference, but for, uh, the first uh, step that will be important to meet will be uh, on the 1st of January 2021, when some uh, the initial filings will have to um, give to ITU their deployment plans. This uh, process was agreed at the conference with also a number of transitional measures that are very important and that have been adopted to address, to address all the cases of non-GSO systems that were in fact brought into use either before the conference or before the 1st of January 2021. I will not go into the details of these transitional measures uh, during this um, presentation. But uh, you may know that uh, ITU has published the radio regulations uh, of the uh, 2020 edition last uh, month. So I really encourage you to go on our website and download the uh, 2020 edition of this uh, radio regulations. And then you can uh, look uh, in detail to a resolution called Resolution 35, which gives all the details of this milestone process and all the, ex the exceptions, the transitional measures, and so on. So this is an interesting read. This is about uh, 10 pages of regulatory um, uh, wording. It's uh, either good for sleep or good for work, <laughs> probably not so much for leisure. But uh, I really encourage you to download the radio regulations and look in details to this uh, part of the radio regulations to uh, really understand the details of the decision of WRC-19. Now, what is the objective of today's um, webinar is uh, to hear from the uh, five main um, non-GSO uh, constellation proponents. First, 
the status of their projects because they, they have various status, uh, they have various uh, projects that are well in shape and we'll hear from each of them uh, where they are, what uh, the, their, their immediate next steps uh, are. And also we will discuss um, whether the decision of WRC 19 affect positively or negatively uh, their uh, operations. We will also try to address what um, is lacking or what should be done in addition to, uh, to facilitate and to uh, help uh, this project to come into fruition and to uh, provide interesting new services to all uh, our uh, fellow citizens. So let me start first with uh, uh, Patricia Cooper. Uh, she's the Vice President for Satellite Government Affairs uh, in SpaceX. And she has led the SpaceX Global Satellite Government Affairs since 2015. <coughs> Welcome, Patricia. So Patricia is directing the regulatory strategy and policy activities for the Starlink satellite constellation, which many of you are certainly aware is a SpaceX next generation satellite network capable of connecting the globe with reliable and affordable broadband service. Patricia is a well-known person in the satellite industry. She has led uh, the Satellite Industry Association for seven years before uh, joining SpaceX. She has also uh, worked at Intelsat or Panamsat, and she also held uh, various senior positions at the FCC International Bureau. Um, she, I would say she is very well accustomed to uh, our regulatory discussion because she has not only uh, have had um, an influential role in the uh, US process, but she has also uh, participated to many uh, ITU uh, WRC conferences. So before giving the floor to Patricia, in fact, we will uh, sh show a brief video that SpaceX provided us. And then I will give uh, Patricia the opportunity to explain to us uh, the status of the SpaceX project. Very good. So Patricia, with such an introduction, I think uh, I mean, uh, there is a lot of expectation about what you will say. There we go. Well, you asked us to show what we were doing. So um, I, I thought we'd go ahead and just show it in, in videos. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for um, starting this, uh, uh, this conference and Mario uh, for all the uh, BR for convening us and bringing us together. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone and be on the panel with, uh, with my colleagues in the NGSO adventures. Um, conversations like this make us kind of miss Sharm el-Sheikh a little bit and the prep sessions and the CICG. It's, uh, um, it's good to see everyone. Um, I'm glad we're keeping well and kind of pushing on with the usual work. Um, I also wanted to just say, I wanna recognize the ITU sort of top to bottom for organizing not just this panel, but across the board. Um, they've really shown an extraordinary dedication and inventiveness in keeping the wheels moving throughout this pandemic, despite all the disruptions and worries that it brings. Um, so I'm impressed and grateful for the, uh, the satellite teams, especially, and I hope we're doing you proud by putting all that deliberation and analysis and processing time uh, towards some real tangible use. Um, for SpaceX, you can see from the video that we've been busy this past year. The highlight was certainly for us carrying NASA astronauts, Bob Bankin and Doug Early, to the International Space Station May and then safely home. That mission completed our final tests under a NASA contract that will now turn towards more regular crewed missions to and from the International Space Station using our Falcon 9 rocket and our Dragon crew capsule. For a company whose mission is human space exploration, that was a powerful milestone for us all. But we're here to discuss Starlink and um, share its progress to date and how the WRC and its decisions 
are uh, interplaying with that. I will note a little intersection with the astronaut mission. Yesterday, we launched 60 more Starlink satellites and that launch used the same first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket that sent B Doug and Bob to the ISS in May. It had been used for an additional mission in between, so that was our third reuse. Um, in fact, Starlink has been the life leader for um, launch reusability. Uh, the, 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 we're now on sixth reuse of certain boosters and uh, the, the first, fifth and first sixth reuse of those first stages were for Starlink missions as well as the first reflown fairings. So Alexander has really asked us to do two things, give a little update on the project and comment on the WRC-19. So I'm gonna try and do this by talking about the status of the space layer, the ground layer and services and link those to the WRC decisions and maybe other, other questions that may still be ahead of us. I'll just note that none of this actual information about Starlink is new. We've put an enormous amount of information into the public already. Um, we've got very in-depth public filings and comments, um, press articles, of course, social media. So, but th this kind of gathering and reshaping of that public information can illustrate where Starlink stands and how, um, it how the work is related to our ongoing advancement. So for the constellation itself, um, you'll recall that we have a constellation of 4,400 some satellites. Um, we have to date, as of yesterday, uh, launched 753 of our Starlink satellites. Um, it is striking, it's really struck me that at the beginning of the conference last year in Charm, we had only launched 60. So it's been um, a, a big deployment push for us. We've hit a cadence in the manufacturing of the satellites, which we do ourselves. We're building about 120 a month right now. Um, and leveraging the reuse of our rockets, we're aiming for about two launches a month, although of late the Florida weather reminds us that Mother Nature has a pretty big say in that goal. At the WRC, this correlates directly to the milestones decisions that Alexandra mentioned at the outset, um, the transition from a single satellite to bring into use uh, and the decision to add deployment milestones for, um, for NGSO. So as a US licensed constellation, we already had deployment milestones in the context of our US license. So we supported the idea of that as an international approach. Um, we probably would have liked even faster expectations for build out, but certainly understand these are enormously complicated projects that require financing, manufacturing, design, launch, business approach, et cetera. All that can take time. We want our fellow NGSOs to succeed. We've designed our system to expect many NGSOs. Um, and we actually hope to launch them. Uh, we're launching at least one of our panel members here and many other from our processing round class at the FCC um, and hope that we'll have the opportunity to deploy more. Um, and of course, with over 700 satellites in place for a constellation of 4,000 some, we've already surpassed the initial mi milestone of 10% well before that deadline and are building onto the next. So in addition to that space layer of the constellation and satellite deployment, um, we've been looking at gateways, uh, which for us are in KA band and uh, building a network of gateways sitting on good fiber that can support the traffic of our constellation for users. Um, they are perhaps the most notable piece is that the spectrum is spectrum sharing with terrestrial. I note that the conference did not take up new allocations for 5G in 28 gigahertz uh, in the KA band. And despite no decisions there, I would just say that um, in various countries, we are looking at um, opportunities to test the way that NGSO KA band gateways can coexist and share spectrum with um, existing uh, or planned terrestrial networks, whether those are microwave networks or the emerging 5G. Um, we're seeing explorations of that in the US and elsewhere. Um, we're big proponents of flexible technology um, for the satellite systems. Uh, and of course, with the uh, terrestrial systems so that we can share spectrum and coexist uh, and, and, and both operate. Um, I'll move on to the sort of general spectrum use, uh, just noting that the directors reported reiterated the importance of operator to operator coordination that set good expectations for us all to work together and talk. And I think across the panel, many of us, if not all of us, are, are in that mix now with much clearer specifics of what our systems are, what will fly and what those capabilities are. That coordination process is yielding some good important discussions 
on what the right principles are about how we interoperate the um, respective capabilities and where we intersect. And I'm glad to see that reinforcement of operator operator talks as the NGSO world becomes even more populated with more folks um, hoping to leverage this kind of platform for various services. We believe that operator operator talks and coordinations are the right um, right path to ensure spectrum efficiency, which at the end of the day is the way that you get more services to citizens. Um, I wanna pick up just briefly on the VBAN decision. I would pair that, um, that topic that Alexandra, you raised with uh, some of the work that's been going on with KA band eSIMs and just saying, I think we're refreshing a little bit the mechanisms and the approach that we're using for EPFD, um, both the tools and the approaches. Uh, on how NGSO systems can protect the geo systems above and other services like the passive earth observation systems. That fresh look, I think is something we're gonna wanna take into the next conference and consider continue to look at ways to update the tools that the BR has to analyze and examine and that we all have to evaluate to make sure we can still protect the services that require protection, but also capture upgraded RF technology that many of us are investing in and fielding. Um, and then finally, for us, the user terminals and service, the other part of the ground network, um, we're already deploying and um, beta testing service internally for friends and family and have been since summer. Um, we haven't released full results from those yet, but we have um, filed public information about those tests with uh, the FCC. Um, and uh, we're pleased with the performance. We've been regularly testing above 100 megabits per second and showing latencies below 40. Um, there'll be more information to come there. Um, our next stage will be to open a public beta service in uh, the US and then onwards internationally. And then of course, matching that with higher volume user terminal production. Um, and if anyone's interested in tracking this or seeing when it'll be available near you, um, we've opened up a, a sign up on starlink.com to do that. So for us, I think we just say we're really pleased at the progress we've had this last year. This has been a busy year. Um, since we were all at Charm, we're eager to put the parameters and the provisions that we've um, that we agreed upon at WRC to practical use. Continue to build out our constellation and roll out actual service. Um, there's much more to do. Uh, we, for us generally and also uh, broadly, we want to make sure that the planning and discussions and um, all enable innovation that basically every company on this panel is fielding and proposing, um, but also give give confidence to the other spectrum users. Uh, on space and at on in space and on the ground um, of the appropriate RF protections. So that's my um, report at a year and date. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Patricia. Very interesting indeed. Um, I noticed that in the Q and A we, we have um, a number of questions about uh, SpaceX, uh, and um, maybe I will take a first one. Is um, do you, do SpaceX have some plan to uh, support um, non-terrestrial uh, 3GPP standards for 5G, or will you uh, more use uh, your own standard? So there's nothing in our system that wouldn't support 3GPP. We don't plan at this point to be an interface directly with a cell phone or a laptop, but we could certainly feed a cell tower or a small cell. Okay. So and I think the latencies that we're seeing are validating that. Yeah, with, with, certain, with this kind of latency, this is certainly feasible. Um, another question that uh, is coming is, um, what about um, inter-satellite links? Do you think is, is they are useful, they are necessary, they are absolutely uh, a must, uh, or do you think that uh, a constellation can live without them? W what is the view of SpaceX about inter-satellite links? Yeah, we've planned inter-satellite links since the very beginning. Um, for our satellites to talk to each other in space with using optical inter-satellite links. Um, we, in fact, we just announced uh, on our previous launch some early uh, tests that we've been doing uh, with, uh, with very high volume transfer between satellites. So we do expect that that will be a feature that we integrate. Um, our approach on satellites has been, on the satellite design has been to continue to iterate and, you know, the first satellites don't look like the last one. So this is definitely an, um, an upgrade uh, for network management that's uh, on the horizon. I, I will say that they are uh, not essential, but there are parts of the world where it's difficult to get a gateway nearby. 
um, in the middle of the ocean or in, in truly remote areas um, that are otherwise not served. So ISLs can not only help with, um, with managing traffic directly some from point to point, but also to reach locations where the kind of gateway construct doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Um, I know many uh, questions from, from the, the, the Q&A. Um, one of them concerned the, um, the famous brightness of the star, uh, mm -hmm. SpaceX uh, satellites. And uh, we know that you have, um, since the beginning, uh, since you were alerted from this problem, worked uh, on that. So maybe um, if you can spend one or two uh, minutes to, uh, to give us um, the, the status, we know to, we have seen in the press many uh, many improvements in the um, in this field, but to, uh, how do you envisage uh, the continuation of this uh, issue mm -hmm. with the uh, astronomers? Right. So this has been um, uh, about a year and a half of very close dialogue with the astronomy community, primarily the optical astronomy community, since of course the radio astronomy community is already part of the work, the um, ITU uh, spectrum family and. Um, those coordinations are sort of already in place, but the, um, the, the two communities of optical astronomy and communication satellites really had been quite separate and neither was particularly well informed about the other. And I think that's really changed partly because the first tranche of satellites that we launched were surprisingly bright for us, for everyone else. So we undertook a year of, um, of learning and um, uh, it, ultimately mitigations. Um, in collaboration with a group of uh, really dedicated astronomers. Um, in fact, this week, there's a conference called the Dark and Quiet Skies Conference that's put on with the, by the International Astronomical Union. And they'll come out with some measurements of some of those mitigations. So what we've done is we've um, taken a good deal of time to understand about our satellites, what makes them bright, uh, visible to the, to the naked eye first, and then also to various kinds of observatories and what can be done to, um, to reduce those impacts. Um, so we set out two goals. One of them is to make the satellites generally invisible to the naked eye, you know, unaided, within about a week of launch. Uh, and for that, we've addressed that with primarily with operational roles as the satellites have been deployed and are going up to orbit. Um, and then the other is to minimize the impact on, on um, telescopes, optical astronomy telescopes, by darkening the satellites or shielding them from the from the suns so that they don't saturate the observatory detectors. And that is basically uh, measured with a variety of tools, but a, a magnitude of how they, how bright they appear. And um, the report with the dark and quiet skies this week has quite a few measurements in it of those fielded experiments. So with this learning, we came up with first one solution, dark sat, which was just to darken uh, the elements and then um, a shielding, which is a, uh, a shield, uh, like a sunshade, uh, to uh, reduce the brightness at uh, uh, on orbit. So we think we're in a good path there. But um, I'd encourage you all to uh, to uh, take a look at the uh, results of this conference this week, and um, also for all the other satellite operators out there to learn about the astronomy community and how your satellites design and operations might uh, affect the optical astronomy community. We'll be encouraging folks to participate. I was glad to see Kuiper and OneWeb uh, join in those conversations too. Thanks a lot, Patricia. Uh, we may have further questions at the end of the, mm -hmm. of the panel, but uh, I'm now proposing that we move to the yep. second panelist, uh, Ms. Thank you. Zoller, thank you again. Um, so Ms. Zoller is the head of the Global Regulatory Affairs at uh, the uh, Amazon's uh, project Kuiper. Uh, as you may know, this uh, project is an initiative to launch a constellation of LEO satellites that will provide low latency and high speed broadband connectivity. Um, and as such, uh, Julie Zoller is responsible for enabling and protecting Kuiper's use of the radio frequency spectrum. Um, <clears throat> before joining uh, Amazon, uh, Ms. Zoller was the chief government affairs officer at Omnispace, but also she served uh, four years at the State Department uh, of the US uh, State Department as a senior deputy coordinator for international uh, communications affairs. Um, 
before that, she has a long career in the space and industry as well as in the uh, US administration. I will not uh, go into all details to let her a little bit of time to present uh, the status of the Amazon project Piper. So Julie, you have now the floor. We will. Thank you very much, Alexander. And, and thank you, Mr. Director opportunity to participate in this webinar and to share some information about Project Kuiper and our plans for delivering global broadband service. Let me take the chance to extend my best wishes to all colleagues as we work through the challenges of this global pandemic. I hope you're all healthy and take pride in being part of a community that is uniquely equipped to enable connectivity options that are essential to working, studying, and sheltering at home. So I have some slides and I believe Jorge is going to manage that. Great. So what is Project Kuiper? It's an Amazon initiative to deliver high speed, low latency broadband connectivity to unserved and underserved individual households, as well as schools, hospitals, businesses, and other organizations without reliable broadband through a constellation of over 3,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. I'm speaking to you from a remote area in northern New York, where the only option I have for internet access is my smartphone. The need for connectivity, especially in rural areas like mine, is real. This pandemic has only highlighted the digital divide and the need for solutions. As I mentioned, Project Kuiper is a long-term initiative and the team is making incredible progress. We've already marked a few important milestones this year. In July, the FCC granted our license. We're hiring and growing quickly assembling a team of world-class scientists and engineers to deliver on this vision. While my team is in the Washington DC area, most of the Kuiper team is in Redmond, Washington, where we have an over 20,000 square meter state-of-the-art facility that will serve as the primary headquarters for research and development and early manufacturing. Amazon plans to invest more than $10 billion to build and scale our ground network, accelerate satellite testing and manufacturing, and deliver an affordable customer terminal that will make fast, reliable broadband accessible. So let's go to the next slide, please. What is the Project Kuiper architecture? Let me start with the satellites we'll have 3,236 satellites at three altitudes and inclinations, 630, 610, and 590 kilometer altitudes at 52, 42, and 33 degree inclinations. That will allow us to provide service from 56 north to 56 south latitude continuously. The satellites will have phased array antennas that produce small steerable spot beams for serving customers. Because of our low orbits and Kuiper's high-tech antennas, we'll provide fiber-like service with high speeds, high capacity, and low latency. We're going to build and deploy the constellation in five phases, starting with the highest altitude, highest inclination shell. In phase one, we plan to launch 578 satellites. This is half the satellites in the 630 kilometer shell and enough to start service. In phase two, we'll begin to populate the shell at 610 kilometers and we'll continue building out through the five phases when all 3000 satellites will be operational. We're an all KA band system with downlinks in the 17.7 to 18.6 and 18.8 to 20.2 gigahertz bands and uplinks in the 27.5 to 30 gigahertz band. 
The satellite and ground stations are only part of what it takes to build a global network. Much of the effort happens on the ground, moving and storing data securely, delivering terminals to customers' homes and businesses, customer service and billing, all important aspects of the satellite broadband business and customer experience and areas where Amazon has extensive knowledge. Let's go to the last slide. ITU's work is vitally important to Project Kuiper and the advancement of NGSO systems in general, which involve questions of a worldwide character that are the focus of World Radio Communication Conferences. Working Party 4A's foundational work on recommendations and reports in this area is also important. So I wanna to look to the future and the WRC 23 agenda items that I'd like to highlight today. And the first is agenda item seven on the filing process for satellite networks, advanced publication, coordination and notifications. The article 21 PFD scaling factor for NGSOs in the frequency band 17.7 to 19.3 gigahertz needs to be updated to take into account larger constellations, which weren't envisioned 20 years ago when the equations were adopted. Another issue under agenda item seven is establishing orbital tolerance parameters for NGSOs and alignment between notified and deployed orbital characteristics which affects our understanding of bringing into use, meeting deployment milestones and sharing. And finally, there's the NGSO post milestone deployment reporting and ensuring that the content of the master register is aligned with what's on orbit. I'd also like to mention agenda item 1.16, which deals with NGSO earth stations in motion in the KA band and aims to enable the type of mobility applications which are in high demand. Working Party 4A does vital work outside of the work preparatory process. We're working on updating the recommendation that contains the functional description for the software tool used to determine NGSO compliance with EPFD limits. The goal of this work is to revise recommendation 1503 to more accurately model today's NGSO systems, which ultimately improves the efficient use of the radio frequency spectrum. We also need to make sure that the EPFD validation software stays up to date with the specification. And finally, I'll mention NGSO sharing issues arising from Resolution 769 adopted by WORK19. Here, there's a need to develop the mechanism for assessing aggregate interference from NGSO systems, taking into account realistic modeling and sharing parameters. So with that, I'll, I'll end my presentation today and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Julie. It's a very uh, interesting and uh, informative uh, presentation. I see some uh, questions from the Q&A uh, from the audience. So let's uh, jump to them directly. Um, a very similar question for as for SpaceX is that um, what is the, the what are the plans of uh, the project Creeper with regard to supporting the 3 GPP standards for non terrestrial networks? Do, do you plan to um, to do so, or uh, do you simply plan to to have backhaul uh, capacities? Our, that's a good question. Our plan is to backhaul capacity for for mobile network. Thanks a lot. Um, another question uh, is uh, why uh, do you, are, are you not so interested to cover the poles? Um, I would say this is the constellation design that we're starting with, but as with all of Amazon, innovation is always at the forefront of our thinking. 
And certainly um, covering the polls is a possibility for the future. So stay, stay tuned. I have no announcements today, but. Uh... Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, also, um, I, I read some uh, some similar uh, questions about the role of intersatellite links. Um, you, you mentioned that you, you will use them. Uh, how do you see uh, them in, in the architecture? Um, are they essential, uh, useful, or simply uh, uh, simply uh, absolutely necessary? Intersatellite links are an important future innovation I, that allow, as Patricia has said, the um, choice of selecting gateway locations in areas which may be more favorable in terms of fiber connectivity. Um, intersatellite links would also be an important part of providing maritime and aeronautical services for NGSOs where you have long distances over oceans and you know it's not possible to find a gateway from, from where you are. So it's certainly something that we're looking at very carefully. Thanks a lot, Julie. I'm sure that there will be a further questions during the, uh, final, uh, the final Q and A with all the panelists, but for the time being, I propose that we move to uh, Mr. Mario Neri from Telesat. So Mario Neri has more than 13 years of experience in the satellite industry and is responsible for securing the appropriate spectrum and orbital resources for the LEO constellation that Telesat is planning to deploy in the near future. Um, in order to do so, it takes uh, a role of coordinating the access to these resources with other users, um, including so other satellite operators and uh, notably the four others that are on this uh, panel. And uh, prior to Telesat, uh, Mr. Uh, Neri uh, worked for uh, the UK communications regulator Ofcom, but also with uh, Intel, uh, Inmarsat and uh, Utelsat, two uh, big uh, global satellite operators, mainly in the GSO field. So now, Mario, I will let you make your presentation and then uh, we will uh, uh, ask uh, you some questions that the audience may wish to address to you. Mario, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, first of all, let me check whether you can see my slides in full screen. I see yes. Jorge nodding. So um, before I start, let me thank you and the director and all the staff at the Bureau to invite myself as the representative of Telesat to this interesting webinar. Uh, we are glad to be here with our uh, non-GSO colleagues and all the other um, uh, attendees. Uh, let me also express my sincere gratitude to the Bureau and to the ITU to have swiftly organized yourself in supporting these initiatives remotely. I'm positively, positively impressed of, of all the tools that you made uh, available to the membership. So um, uh, congratulations, uh, seriously. So. Um, let me let me spend uh, these uh, minutes that you're kindly giving me to uh, uh, explain to you and the uh, and the audience uh, what is Telesat Leo. Uh, so first of all, Telesat you may know is a, a is a satellite operator that started its business in 1969, and we currently operate uh, 16 geostationary satellites. And uh, a few years ago, we started thinking uh, of, um, of uh, embarking a new project, uh, which consists in deploying a, a LEO constellation, not just a constellation that will coexist with our uh, geostationary fleet. So we uh, believe that our constellation will be a, a, a key enabler, as the title of the slide uh, says, for truly global connectivity. And let me explain um, a few details of Telesat Leo. Uh, there are a few technical details. I hope that the audience will like that. And also uh, the final part of my presentation will uh, 
uh, hint at what are, in our view, the development of the regulatory framework that we believe is going to be useful for the uh, non just non stationary constellations of the future. So first of all, um, uh, let me explain briefly why uh, Talisat as an established uh, geostationary satellite operator um, decided to invest a lot of resources in uh, deploying uh, and designing and deploying a non-geostationary constellation. Well, basically, we believe that there is a, a market out there that needs to be served uh, because uh, we uh, believe that we have identified a connectivity white space between the uh, terrestrial connectivity solutions that offer uh, high quality service in, in terms of speed and latency, but uh, that they are not available globally. But at the same time, uh, we need a satellite solution that is different from uh, the GSO satellite solution, because as we know, the uh, geostationary satellites are great and will continue to be great for certain applications. But when you look at um, a, a sort of fiber-like connectivity that is available everywhere uh, outside the um, crowded places where usually the terrestrial fiber solutions are, uh, are, are available, uh, you need something new. And we believe that the, the, the solution, part of the solution uh, is gonna be uh, a non-gestationary satellite constellation um, uh, well-designed. So uh, let me describe what we have in mind, uh, what uh, actually what we, uh, our constellation will be. Uh, so basically um, we, are, uh, we are going to launch, we will launch and deploy uh, not thousands of satellites, but uh, let's say only uh, around 300 satellites. And these will be deployed in two uh, different orbital planes. Uh, one or a, uh, uh, sorry, orbit uh, sub-constellations, let, let's call them. Uh, a first set of orbital planes will be uh, polar orbits that uh, are um, designed to cover basically uh, the whole globe, especially the poles. Uh, that in our view, uh, because in our view in the poles, there is a market segment that needs to be uh, served and addressed. And then we will also deploy interleaved with these uh, uh, polar subconstellation and inclined subconstellation that instead will uh, we'll try to address the demand in those areas of the world that are mostly populated. Uh, we plan to deploy most of our satellites in the inclined subconstellation, 220 uh, uh, to be exact. And uh, the rest of the satellites, 78, will uh, be deployed in the polar constellation. If you look at the picture on the right hand side of the uh, slide, um, that provides me a, an opportunity to describe more technically what uh, our constellation uh, will look like. First of all, we will be using the K-band spectrum uh, uh, totally. So we will be using the K-band spectrum not only for the user links, but also for the, uh, let's say, feeder links or gateway links. Uh, the satellites that we plan to, uh, that we will deploy are uh, quite complex. Uh, they, in fact, they will have steerable and shapeable uh, spot beams that will radiate the energy where uh, it is needed. So uh, we will use the spectrum resources and the power available on board of the satellites only where there is a customer need. Uh, so we will not waste uh, power around, let's say, or we will not use spectrum, um, uh, not wisely. We will have, of course, uh, onboard processing in the sense that all the uh, communication will be processed on board of the satellite and will be routed uh, around as the uh, IP traffic requires. And let me stress, uh, taking into account the questions that have been asked, that we believe that the inter-satellite links are a key feature for a successful constellation. And this is why we, are, we have uh, designed from the beginning uh, uh, the fact that our satellites will be equipped with inter-satellite link uh, laser, inter-satellite links that will allow uh, the uh, exchange of uh, high throughput be between the satellites. And this is uh, mostly for two reasons, not only because using inter-satellite links uh, provides um, uh, a way 
to reduce the number of gateway or stations that you need to have deployed using a similar architecture uh, without uh, intersatellite links. But uh, also because intersatellite links provide a, a way to make sure that the satellite network is more resilient and uh, allows for more flexibility. So using these uh, intersatellite links allows to uh, have pre-configured or um, particular routing options that other uh, designs uh, do not allow. And of course, all of this will be uh, orchestrated by a uh, network operating system that will manage all the resources of the constellation. So uh, from a high level perspective, our uh, constellation will basically be a virtual fiber on the sky. So what I mean by that is that uh, we will provide a simple uh, ethernet layer to service. Uh, our customers, will basically have a terminal or a number of terminals that will be connected to uh, this virtual fiber in the sky, this virtual ethernet on the sky. And then their traffic will be routed either to the internet or to a uh, private network of the customers or a combination of the two through a telesat point of presence. Uh, so, these, uh, we, we believe that this is necessary because uh, you, we know that a lot of customers uh, need this kind of service and this is the kind of uh, communication service that is offered by comparable terrestrial solutions. This, uh, this slide also allows me to highlight which are the uh, uh, customers that we plan to serve. Um, the vertical segments that uh, we will uh, be focused on are, uh, first of all, uh, terrestrial, uh, back, uh, terrestrial providers by offering them backhaul, backhauling solutions. Uh, and then we will offer service to government providers and also to aviation and maritime. So uh, I will explain later that in our view, uh, allowing for mobility in the K-band is uh, uh, a key thing that the ITU could help you know, just so operators to, uh, to succeed in the future. So um, I want also to spend a little bit more time on this blue cloud by expanding what, uh, what, what that means in terms of a network architecture. So basically uh, what mm, we plan to offer to our customers uh, is a uh, on, as you can see on the left-hand uh, side of the slide, a, a point of entry to our uh, to our network through a user terminal that can vary, whose characteristics can vary based on the service that we want to offer. And then this user terminal being managed by our network control center will uh, study what is the best uh, routing that the traffic from the user uh, needs to go through in order to reach uh, its target. So by using a, a combination of uh, satellite links, optical intersatellite links, and uh, a network of landing stations, uh, we, we will make sure that the traffic from the customer will get to the, uh, to the intended target uh, using our point of presence. And uh, once the, the traffic gets to the point of presence, uh, which is managed by Telesat, uh, the customer can decide whether to connect directly to that point of presence or just to have that uh, traffic uh, routed, routed to the internet and go, getting it back uh, to a similar path uh, backward. So uh, let me also explain uh, what are the uh, user terminals that we plan, to, uh, we plan to offer. Of course, this list is not exhaustive, but I want just to give you an idea of uh, the kind of uh, technical solutions that we have in mind. Um, as I said, uh, part of our customer, uh, the customers that we, we will serve are, um, are in the aeronautical sector. So definitely we will, our system will support uh, electronic, electronically steered antennas of um, different dimensions. We will have hybrid terminals that um, uh, plan to employ different technologies from phased array to some more physical um, steering capabilities, or 
we will also uh, employ mechanical, mechanically steering antenna for land applications or even for maritime uh, applications. And of course, uh, the different terminals will provide different kind of throughputs and different kind of performance uh, to the customers as, uh, as it is needed. Um, we will be able, thanks to uh, our architecture, to deliver uh, multiple gigabytes per second of throughput towards a, a single uh, spot on Earth if it's needed in order, uh, by just aggregating the capacity coming from different beams of the same of different satellites. So definitely, this is why uh, I was saying we, we designed our constellation in order to make sure that the performance of the service that we are going to uh, offer is comparable to other solutions, mainly terrestrial solutions that are available out, uh, out there. Uh, what about the service timeline? Um, we uh, we will uh, deploy. Uh, we will start deploying our uh, polar constellation uh, in 2022, and uh, as soon as the, the, there are enough resources out there, we will uh, pr start providing services uh, to the uh, portion of the Earth that are north or south, 55 degrees of north or south latitude. And we plan to uh, offer a full global service uh, starting from 2023, when after deploying our satellites in the polar sub-constellation, we will start uh, deploying uh, the satellites in the inclined sub-constellations in order to provide a, a, a global service in the way that we intend to. Another important thing uh, is that in uh, January 2018, we launched uh, our first uh, satellite um, uh, that we call the uh, LEO-1. And uh, this satellite uh, has allowed us to uh, carry out a lot of tests with uh, potential customers. As I said, uh, Telesat is an established uh, satellite operator. We have a, a, um, a large portfolio of, cu of customers that have expressed to us their interest and their requirements uh, for uh, non-geostationary uh, connectivity in KA band. So what we have done is to try to test with some of them um, uh, and some other partners uh, the, uh, the capabilities that non-geostationary connectivity uh, can offer. And we carried out a, a lot of tests. This list is non-exhaustive. Uh, going from land applications to uh, maritime applications to aeronautical applications. And what we saw, even with uh, a, a first generation satellite, like the one that we deployed in 2018, we saw that the performance uh, that can be offered by a, a non-gestationary satellite operating in KA band is uh, uh, astonishing. Um, we achieved the uh, uh, very uh, low latencies and uh, throughput that we did not even imagine possible ourselves. So this is a proof to say that we believe that these kind of solution, a non-gestational constellation uh, works if well designed and we, we try to prove it before um, finalizing our design and starting deploying our constellation. So let me then uh, finish my presentation since we are uh, ITU aficionados uh, uh, on the, let's say the top three ITU wishes, I would say that a, in our view, a non-geostationary operator may have in the near future. Uh, I, I thought of the three main problems that we would like the ITU to help us addressing in order to give us the regulatory certainty that we need to deploy uh, such a complex system that, like the one that we will deploy. The first thing uh, is, uh, as you also mentioned uh, uh, previously, uh, is the definition of orbital tolerances. As you mentioned, uh, Alexandre, uh, WRC 19 um, uh, adopted resolution 35 on the uh, non-GSO milestones. And among, uh, beyond doing that, also clarified the definition of a notified orbital plane for a, a non-justitionary uh, satellite, especially for a non-justitionary satellite. And WRC-19 basically uh, helped us at identifying uh, the only four orbital parameters on which the tolerances should be studied. And these are the inclination of the orbital plane, uh, as you know, the altitude of the perigee and apogee, 
and, and the uh, argument of the perigee. So we believe that uh, in the next study cycle, I believe that this is, uh, there is a high chance that this will become an issue under agenda item seven uh, to, um, uh, to analyze uh, these uh, orbital tolerances. And I must say that from an operator's perspective, this is extremely important because only by knowing what are the tolerances that we can play with or we can stay within, uh, we will be able to plan our uh, operations uh, in the best possible way. So the, the, the second thing um, is uh, uh, the, the possibility of defining what is the probability of harmful interference in those scenarios, in those interference scenarios when a non-GSO system is, uh, is involved. And uh, why do we believe that this is an important thing? As uh, we all know, and as you mentioned, Alexander, um, non-GSO operators uh, are coordinating actively uh, between ourselves. I mean, uh, we, are, we are talking to all the, uh, my fellow colleagues that uh, are in this panel. But we believe that the, uh, the coordination discussions uh, require very uh, complex studies that uh, have a lot of uh, unknowns. And we believe that what the ITU could do to help us is to define a regulatory scenario that is similar to the one that applies between uh, GSO networks. Um, as you know, the, uh, as you well know, Alexandre, uh, uh, in case of the geostationary uh, networks, when there, is, there needs to be coordination between two geostationary satellites, uh, the, you have a powerful a tool uh, at hand, which is uh, the examination under 1132A, for which uh, the Bureau has a methodology to carry out a, a prob a, a, the assessment for the probability of harmful interference. Unfortunately, this tool is not available uh, when a non-geostationary system is uh, um, involved, especially in the KA band, not only when two non-geostationary systems need to coordinate with, between each other, but also when a non-geostationary system needs to coordinate with a GSO network and vice versa in certain parts of the KA band. So what we believe would be uh, needed is to start the work uh, uh, at the ITU to define a similar scenario a similar framework that would also help us to operate on a non-interference, non-protection basis while we are completing coordination since that uh, requires uh, a lot of time to be uh, completed. Unfortunately, we are experiencing ourselves. And finally, I hope that I'm not over time. Uh, the third thing that uh, we would like to see is a positive outcome of um, uh, agenda item 1.16 for WRC 23, which means allowing uh, CAB and connectivity through non-geostationary systems on mobile platforms. Um, this is one of my hobbies uh, at the ITU to deal with ESIMs. And uh, I believe that there has been a, um, the, the, the ITU in general and the two previous conferences have uh, uh, obtained, uh, have made a great uh, um, success uh, at al allowing uh, earth stations in motions to operate with geostationary satellites. And I believe that we can use the experience that we uh, accrued in the previous two conferences to make similar decisions or to inform our views on how a regulatory framework could be shaped for a non-geostationary uh, easings and uh, let me uh, let me take uh, 30 more seconds in this slide uh, because um, one of the tests that we made we carried out with one of our partners is actually to demonstrate that aeronautical connectivity in cave and using no geostationary system is actually possible and what we did uh, was an experiment through which a an easing on an aircraft was able to communicate with our LEO-1 satellite and switch to uh, one of our geostationary satellite having cable and payload to simulate non-GSO handovers. And I must say that the performance that this link provided uh, was beyond expectation. So we have already the proof that this technology works and can be deployed quickly. So this ends my presentation. I'll be happy to answer uh, any question that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. And uh, yes, we are a little bit beyond schedule. So I will ask you um, one question. 
Has as Telesat considered the use of QVBAN for feeder links? And if yes, why did you decide finally against it? Well, definitely we have considered it, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is one of, uh, of our plans in the future. We did not want to uh, since we we have already invested like more than hundred millions dollars in R and D for our constellation in KA band, and what we targeted the KA band because we believe that the technology in KA band is a little bit more mature than the technology in Q, in QMV band. And in order to find the right balance between a technically sound uh, non-gestationary constellation and uh, a, uh, an achievable time to market, we believe to concentrate on K-band first. But I don't exclude that we will look at that band in the future. Thank you very much, Mario. Well, I think there will be more questions for you at the end of this panel. But for the time being, let's move to uh, OneWeb and to uh, Russ uh, Pritchard Kelly. I'm glad uh, to welcome. Uh, so Ruth has over 25 years of experience in the communication satellite industry. She is currently the vice president for regulatory affairs uh, for OneWeb. And uh, she oversees the uh, team of the legal, technical, and policy analysis to work to um, reform regulatory inspection policies uh, for newer non-GSO uh, satellite constellations such as OneWeb. Before joining OneWeb, uh, Russ was the director of regulatory affairs for O3B, now uh, SES Networks. Uh, she also worked for <coughs> a law firm, um, now Morgan Stanley, and also the American Mobile Satellite Corporation. So as you can see, she has a wide uh, knowledge of the satellite industry. And I will let her introduce uh, the presentation of OneWeb. And by the way, uh, congratulations for the uh, news that uh, OneWeb has now uh, le left uh, Chapter 11 uh, situation. So I think you are quite uh, relieved. And uh, this is certainly a good news for the space industry. Ruth, you have the, uh, the floor. Thank you, Alexandra. Yes, I think. Um... I think the, uh, the OneWeb uh, employees are uh, uh, excited, uh, possibly even more excited than, than the rest of the industry. Um, this has been uh, an amazing uh, resurrection of a company, not the first by any means, uh, to go into and out of bankruptcy in the satellite world. It's, a, it's an expensive world. Um, and I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Jorge, are you going to start the slides for me? We can move right into uh, the second slide, and, and I'll give people an update on where we are uh, with the with the bankruptcy process and our new owners. Appreciate it. So moving right on to the the first real content slide. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard um, right about the time that uh, the COVID pandemic shut down the world. It also shut down financing. I'm sure we weren't the only company to be affected, but it was um, so uh, disastrous for us that we had to uh, declare bankruptcy, which in the United States is called using chapter 11 uh, for protection and restructuring. A reason to use the United States, even though we are a UK company, um, is because of its very mature um, and um, uh, sensitive approach Um, to the bankruptcy, it, it, the, the, the U.S. code recognizes that it isn't just our company, but all of our partners and all of our contracts um, that are also uh, affected by our bankruptcy. And everything gets frozen while the court uh, reviews the situation. And what that means is that a partner can't uh, break the contract, making our situation even worse, right? So, so um, uh, much to our great, uh, great joy, Uh, both uh, uh, the UK government uh, and Barty Global, uh, probably one of the largest, if not the largest mobile network operator uh, in the world, um, well known, I'm sure to all of you, um, came in with nearly a billion dollars worth of funding. Um, that uh, uh, new ownership has been approved uh, by the bankruptcy court. Um, and now we're just waiting for some final approvals um, Uh, to sort of cross the T's and dot the I's. And we expect to be uh, fully out of that sort of legal protection um, by December, January at the latest. 
it has not stopped um, our behavior as, as a growing satellite enterprise, by the way. We have continued to um, uh, build the satellites with our joint venture, OneWeb Satellites. Um, we've continued to apply for and receive licenses around the world, continue to have discussions with other investors, by the way. Um, and um, we expect to start our restart, our uh, regular launches, uh, fingers crossed uh, in December of this year, right? So we've, we've worked through the contracts with uh, the launch vehicle and the manufacturers um, and everything is, is, is coming along very nicely. So those will start again. Again, it's roughly 36 satellites launched at a time by Ariane on a Soyuz. And the next launch should be out of the Russian site Vostoshny. Um, it is uh, interesting, um, super interesting, I think, to everybody on this call. I hope that the pandemic not only was a, 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 a direct source of OneWeb's problems, but it has also proved our business case, right? The fact that people uh, need connectivity wherever we are, the chat, when people checked in to say where they were, it's every ITU region in the world. The entire globe is connected wirelessly, right? With remote locations. And so the need for this kind of connectivity is, is, is absolutely proven. So those people who are like, meh, how many people are gonna need this, right? It's really the population centers that need connectivity. That's not true anymore. People are fleeing high density population areas if they can. They're going to islands, they're going to remote locations, right? We have understood that there is a need to be distanced. And furthermore, there isn't a need to be all in the same city. We can do great work with, with remote connectivity. So um, this is an exciting time for the ITU and the, and the LEO and non-geostationary operators in the world. Obviously, we think that LEO is better than MEO or GEO, um, and that's why our company is at LEO. I don't think I need to explain the value of, of lower latency to anybody on this call. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit more about our attitude toward responsible space. I've seen in the questions, uh, many questions about both orbital debris and the, and the optical astronomy situation. So I'll address that a little later. If we could move on to the next slide. Um, so here, just to remind people, uh, most people today are communicating via the internet. I imagine most of us are connected uh, to this via the internet. Um, very few of us will be using a geostationary satellite connection, um, although we could be. Um, geostationary is obviously the, the, the absolute best uh, technology for point to multi-point. Uh, 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 you know, broadcasting of information uh, is a little less good for two-way communication, right? People, people know you don't like to have a voice call and you time out on the internet if you're actually trying to do um, many of today's applications. So this has increased the demand for non-geostationary, right? It's not a coincidence um, that the non-geos are finding a market and finding a demand um, when they didn't 20 years ago, right? When the internet was, was brand new and when mobile phones were in uh, 1G, let alone 2G, right? That world has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, if not 15, right? And now everybody wants and needs um, uh, a 4G connection, a 4G connection to their personal mobile device. And so these non-geos are gonna be part of that delivery service, part of the infrastructure and the backbone that's being used to get all of those applications at the bottom to you and your phone, wherever you are. Next slide, please. Um, and it also uh, goes, uh, I think without saying, and, and yet here I will have a whole slide on it, um, that you can't lay a fiber to somebody in the air or the middle of the ocean. So, so getting these applications and these services and this connectivity to people everywhere means being able to use a technology that can reach airplanes and ships as well as individuals no matter where they are. 
Uh, right now, OneWeb's first generation is looking at about 600 uh, satellites in a low Earth orbit at 1,200 kilometers. There is nobody else at that particular altitude. It is one of the reasons we chose it to avoid other constellations. Um, they're a, a small satellite compared to traditional satellites. They're about 150 kilos, about the size of a, of a washing machine. Um, and, and we are in polar orbits, and right now we're spacing those uh, at about 12 planes around the world with, with roughly 50 satellites per plane. Great look angle for satellites, uh, I mean, for, for airplanes, especially those uh, traveling, say, from, from the population centers in Europe to those in North America. Um, you're sort of directly underneath a satellite at all time. Um, it's just going to change the user experience um, considerably. Next slide, please. Oh, I think this is going to be our um, video, so thank you. Since the beginning, the World Wide Web has never been worldwide. But in 2021, a new and truly global 5G-ready network will fix that. Say you're working on the edge of the world and need to do a video call. Perhaps you're mid-ocean or mid-air. Wherever you are, you'll have a signal. OneWeb will connect your device through a customized terminal that can be as small as a briefcase and just as compact. Whatever your location, the terminal encrypts your data and sends it at high speed to our satellite fleet passing overhead. These spacecraft are radically innovative, built in our own factory at 1 50th the traditional time and cost, shrunk to the size of a washing machine, yet engineered to deliver powerful throughput. Month by month, we're growing our satellite fleet and by 2021, we'll have not only the global spectrum rights, but the network reach to deliver truly worldwide coverage. And here's the revolutionary part. The fleet will be in low Earth orbit, 30 times closer to Earth than geostationary satellites. This gives you a stable, real-time connection with no interruption or annoying lag. What's more, our fleet always keeps moving, orbiting in a constellation design that creates seamless coverage. Each satellite uses a set of beams to cover an area the size of Alaska. Terrain is no obstacle. From its flight path and pattern, our fleet can always find your signal, so we can get you online from even the trickiest locations, with look angles that geo-satellite broadband simply can't deliver. We maintain high-grade system resilience from two ops centers using state-of-the-art ops concepts. Cloud architecture gives us powerful scalability and control remotely. For example, we can remove satellites at the end of their service life so that the only trace we'll leave in space is on your screen right now. Now back to that video call of yours. We beam your data back down to Earth to our nearest satellite network portal then via one of our point of presence gateways, positioned in secure locations, trusted by global providers, it re-enters the web. The journey you've just watched takes, at most, one tenth of a second. And there they are. Your video call is good to start, whether with colleagues or your family back home. So from 2021, you need never be out of signal or out of mind. OneWeb will connect you from unconnectable locations and keep you productive on the move. It will be a breakthrough year when OneWeb technology creates real human progress, connecting everywhere for everyone. Great, just move on to the next slide, please. Uh... So one of the questions I saw was about how expensive um, people tend to think of satellites, which I think is a little unfair. Um, but in any event, today's smaller satellites uh, are going to be vastly less costly to produce, and that will be passed on to the customers for sure. Um, for example, I know uh, Patricia uh, already mentioned how SpaceX is manufacturing 
um, uh, nearly 100 satellites was it a, a month. Um, so OneWeb also has an assembly line that it has um, really revolutionized with the help of our partner Airbus. Um, and we have a facility in Florida um, and each one of the assembly lines can make a satellite a day. And when, when you think that the traditional satellites used to take uh, 18 to 24 months to build um, and they cost uh, two to $300 million, um, this is revolutionary, right? Um, these satellites cost a roughly $1 million to make. Um, and that's gonna go down when, in time, as you know. So um, the assembly line um, and the idea of, of quickly and easily swapping out different payloads on the existing buses, upgrading various parts of the bus. Um, this is a, a, a real revolution. It's happening in the launch vehicle market as well, right? Um, where the launch vehicles themselves are, are adapting to launch um, multiples of smaller satellites as opposed to one or at most two uh, very, very large satellites. So these changes are gonna reduce the price and make things happen more quickly and allow upgrading uh, of new iterations of, of these constellations. Next slide, please. By the way, if you haven't seen it, the National Geographic has an in, just a, a delightful short documentary called Made in a Day. Um, it's a series and one of those is about the OneWeb satellite uh, factory in, in Florida making satellites in a day. Um, so so the, the the fixed markets is going to be the, the first ones to, to use uh, these non-geostationary satellites, right? Um, these are the ones that have established uh, cell phone and mobile phone customers. They need to have um, reliable backhaul to remote locations. Um, and that's what these uh, non-geostationaries are going to do. Um, by putting a terminal uh, anywhere, um, you can connect via Wi-Fi to a, a mile or two uh, away from that terminal. You can have it on your own building. You can have it on a pole in the middle of nowhere. You can put it on a plane, on a ship. And the terminal market is what is going through incredible R&D right now. This is the location. If you have extra money, you should be looking into um, innovating in the terminals to receive these low earth orbit signals. Um, I think the Holy Grail, which is uh, space-based, directly to handheld. Um, uh, we're not there yet, but I have great faith in the engineers of the world. I know what they've done in the past uh, with technology and I hope that they will, um, will get there. But in the meantime, um, as long as you can put a, a, a slightly larger briefcase or pizza box terminal near, near you, uh, you can then have a Wi-Fi connection and bring up an entire building or an entire community um, uh, uh, the man packs are being developed as well, I know for, for all of us. Um, so this is, this is coming. Um, uh, but in the, in the short term, in the 2021, 2022 timeframe, we're probably looking at larger, more traditional earth stations. Of course, the non-geostationary need at least two uh, trackable uh, traditional parabolic antennas. But again, by 2022, 23, um, the electronically steered, the flat panels, these are going to be in a wider production um, and they're going to be snapped up. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, the, the, this is the issue between uh, the different technologies, the different satellite technologies, right? Is what uh, technology is going to give the end user the best experience? Um, and, and it's not just going to be a question of geo versus Leo, but there's also fiber and there's also terrestrial uh, 3, 4, and eventually 5G. Um, and we all know that the user does not care what technology is used as long as it works. And if it's that last meter, if it's the Wi-Fi that fails, look how angry we are or how quick we are to blame uh, the, the kid next door for uh, streaming a stupid video when you're trying to do work and you're, you're, you think you're sharing uh, the bandwidth with your neighbors. So, 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 so multiple technologies are involved and we as a larger industry and we within the ITU community have got to be aware that it's an ecosystem, that there's a network of networks that is needed to bring first 
everyone to 4G, right? We all know that there are, are vast number of people uh, with 2G or nothing. Um, so let's bring everyone to 4G. And then as 5G comes on board, obviously satellite has to be part of that space-based. It may not be satellite, it may be drones, it may be HAPS, right? Um, uh, but but a, but a space-based technology will have to be part of it. Um, and, and we have to recognize that the regulators got to keep the uh, options open for the best technology for different pockets of, of population within their country. Next slide, please. I think I've talked about all of this. We're fast, we're global. So we will do poll to poll um, and, and the entire uh, world. Um, we hope it'll be simple. Um, we're really hoping to, to especially in, in times of, of uh, disaster, to be able to uh, drop uh, a box with a, with a terminal and with uh, mobile phones in it, uh, maybe even a bicycle um, for power if, if there's no solar. Um, we're really thinking about the quick and easy way for someone to be up uh, and, and operational and not just first responders, right? The whole community needs to get back online as soon as possible when there's been a disruption. So we're focused on that as well. Um, next slide, please. All right, so the final slide, I talk about responsible space. Um, so again, I mentioned that we chose a, an orbit where there wasn't someone, that's one way to be responsible, not have, not have your uh, altitudes uh, overlapping. Um, we uh, actually have already put a, a magnetic grappling structure on the outside of our satellites. Although the debris removal industry is not yet mature, it's coming along, right? There are companies like Astroscale and, and others in the world who are devising affordable ways uh, to go into space and retrieve debris, uh, retrieve, remove the existing garbage. So we're ready um, for, for when that comes along. Um, we are testing on the ground so that we don't purposely launch garbage, that we are not purposely launching something that we're not sure if it works. We've launched 74 satellites and we have 100% operational. I wanna say that again, 100% of our 74 satellites are operational. Now, I, I hope not to bring down uh, uh, um, bad karma on me, but, but one of the reasons is our philosophy is to get it right on the ground before we launch it. Space is a long way away and it's hard to clean up after ourselves. It's big, I know it's big, but the world's attitude toward the environment has changed, not only on the ground, but in space, and we have to be responsible in our approach to it. Um, and as for the optical astronomy community, we too have been talking to them for years. Um, uh, and, and although we were uh, not active in, in the previous six months, uh, we weren't active with anybody really, in the previous six months, uh, as we were sort of um, quieted by our bankruptcy situation. Um, but it's, um, uh, you know, during the pandemic, somebody said, even my mother-in-law bought a telescope to look at the skies. So people are, are more aware than ever of how beautiful the stars are. Um, and um, while they get excited when they hear that they can see the International Space Station uh, with their naked eye and, and here's the app you can download. They get excited when they understand that they could see a Starlink, a, a whole string, a, a link of, of, of Starlink satellites going across the sky. Um, they're also troubled. They also think, uh-oh, this is going to forever change the view. So uh, none of the geo, uh, uh, excuse me, none of the Leos uh, want that, right? Um, so we're working closely with the community um, to understand um, the, the, the issues they've got with brightness um, and how we can avoid interfering with their observations, not only with the naked eye, but deep space. Um, this is of concern to everybody. It's a good conversation. As Patricia said, there's a, uh, another session this week on dark and quiet skies. This is something um, that is, is needed uh, for, for the astronomy community. Uh, and at the same time, that community understands that they too want to be connected. They've got massive data needs. They're often remote. Um, so they, 
want what we are bringing to the world. So this is definitely a conversation, um, uh, a discussion about what can be done, uh, not only with our satellites, but with their software and with their telescopes. And what can we help fund as far as developments and improvements in the technologies that they are using um, so as to make sure that we're all coming to the best possible uh, conclusion. I think that is the end of my um, presentation. Jorge, the last slide just has my, uh, my email. I can't believe I'm giving this out to people. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> you, you may discover the, the consequence in the next hours. <laughs> But thank you thank very you. much uh, for, for this uh, very detailed and interesting presentation. I think many people were eager to, uh, to better understand the situation of OneWeb and uh, um, how you, you are doing. Um, I have one question uh, uh, on the Q&A. Uh, we have seen in the press many things about OneWeb and uh, one of the, uh, of the uh, announcement was that in the future, for future satellites, there may be also hosted payload in addition to the communication payload uh, on the WinWim satellite. Is it something that you are considering or is it completely uh, fake news? <laughs> uh, it's not fake news at all. Obviously, uh, a satellite operator, uh, we're building to make money. And so what our customers want is what we want to deliver. So the first generation, those 600 satellites, those are designed, but we're already building Gen 2 or designing Gen 2 even Gen 3 and Gen 4, right? One of the reasons we look to uh, additional spectrum, <coughs> such as Q and V band, is an awareness that in 10 or 15 years, we're gonna need those bands for our, for our gateway connections or what have you. So um, if, if our uh, main investors um, uh, who are themselves ha have needs, uh, both uh, uh, Her Majesty's government and Barty have ideas about what our satellites should be serving. And so Gen 2 will look to be able to do that. Uh, I know that several of the other uh, presenters talked about inter-satellite links. Um, that's a, 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 an obvious solution to improve latency, to be more efficient, um, but it's not quite there yet. So it's not on our Gen 1 satellites, but we're launching as quickly as we can to offer this first service. Uh, Barty is super interested in, in just having a couple of big parabolic antennas in the middle of a field to, to, to blanket those parts of Africa uh, and India that have nothing. And they're like, look, they've got plenty of room. They don't need the sexy flat panel. We can stick a couple of parabolics in this village, in this town, in this remote location. So the first generation is going to be able to serve um, one of the biggest desires of our new owners. And the second generation, if it can host a payload that would be useful to the UK government, then we will do that. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's now move to the uh, last uh, panelist. And uh, so she's Susan Malloy, working for SES, and in particular on the uh, non-GSO uh, constellations of SES, OSWIBI. The, um, so Susan is a VP for legal and regulatory affairs for SES. I'm particularly pleased that she is able to join us because um, SES, as you know, is uh, also not only operating non-GSO constellation, but they are also operating many GSO satellites. So they are a little bit the, uh, in, the, in the middle of both worlds. So I'm sure that she will be able to provide us with some insights about these aspects. So Su Suzanne has uh, focused on the regulatory strategy for non-GSO uh, satellite market access within SES. And previously she was uh, working as vice president for mobile satellite uh, service operator DBSB, and uh, also also uh, acted as a senior regulatory council for Teledesic. So um, I will let Miss um, Malloy make a presentation, and then we will uh, discuss all together some uh, questions that are, in my view, relevant for all of you. Suzanne, you have the floor. Hi, Alexander. Thanks to, to Mario, to you, and to Jorge for organizing this panel and for being so kind as to invite SES. Um, and Jorge, I will need your kind assistance to um, put on my presentation today. Um, thank you very much. So uh, the next slide, please. As um, uh, Alex, as you mentioned, 
Um, SES has a long history in the satellite in industry um, as a pioneer and an innovator. Um, our, uh, we started as a geostationary satellite company and uh, video distribution has been a, a major part of our business and remains so to this day. We reach more than 350 million households worldwide um, with video and with data connectivity on our geostationary fleet. Um, I'll get into the details of the fleet later, but at this point, we've evolved quite a bit through innovation, through um, being an industry leader <coughs> in providing satellite services. So at this point, we, are, are, we consider ourselves a global managed data services provider. Um, our job is to connect people by a variety of means. Um, cloud applications are a very important um, growing part of our business. Um, of which this, this seminar is a, is a huge example of the kinds of applications that are moving to the cloud and that um, are supporting our ability to do business today and to, and to just connect with each other. Um, telcos, uh, mobile network operators are a big part of our business. Um, internet service providers, enterprises, governments, um, mobility is a very large part of our, our business. And I think you've heard that reflected uh, as well among the other panelists, how important mobility will be in the future to reach all of our customers wherever they may be. Next slide, please. I'm perfectly well. Um, coughing is frightening in the age of COVID, but I'm, uh, <laughs> um, I'm doing quite well, even though I went on mute to, to do that. Let's see. So. Um, Geostationary satellites are our main, uh, as I said, that's how we started out in the business. We have an over 50 satellite fleet. Um, what that uh, particular uh, architecture allows is for us to cover large um, areas, whether or not they are densely populated. Um, geostationary, our geostationary satellites deliver a wide variety of applications. I mentioned video distribution, uh, which it, you know, it's content multicasting but also um, enterprise connectivity is a very important part of what our wide beam satellites do. And you can see there that we use a wide range of frequencies to deliver that C, KU and KA band spectrum. Our high uh, throughput satellites, um, of which we have three and, a, and another one planned, um, are reducing the cost per megabits of delivery of service and enhance our ability to provide connectivity or video and data transmissions. Um, those services are being offered in the KU and KA band. QV band is becoming an important element of supporting high throughput satellite services, as you've heard mentioned um, by the panelists. Um, our non-geostationary satellite system, um, which is a medium Earth orbit high throughput system, is O3B. Um, we've had 20 satellites in operation. We were the first um, commercially operational broadband satellite uh, system. And we're, we're happy to have company soon. Um, we are planning an, an additional 11 satellites. This, this um, should be updated to reflect that um, our Empower constellation will be 11 satellites. Our satellites uh, under our current operational set, uh, constellation deliver up to two gigabits per second uh, per beam with less than 150 milliseconds latency. And these satellites um, are using KA exclusively today. And uh, QV band is, um, uh, as uh, was also mentioned by um, Mario, that's an important part of how we have to plan our future um, uh, constellations. And we, and we have our eye on that for um, enhancing our ability to use uh, KA in the future. Next slide, please. So our, with our current MEO constellation of 20 satellites, um, this constellation has been in operation since 2015. And we've been able to allow our customers to very quickly um, transition to 3G, 4G services, LTE. And we fully expect and have done uh, much testing both with our MEO fleet and our geostationary fleet to be able to support 5G um, applications and be a very integral part of 5G solutions. 
the the innovation for uh, with the Mio fleet has been that we are able to deliver fiber equivalent um, services. So this is a, an enormous amount of capacity. This is typically um, for enterprise service. Um, these services are carrier grade, which means that that the what you see on the screen in terms of a, a MEF certification has meant that we are certified um, using the same standards as terrestrial network to be able to provide fiber-like services. So that means that we are able to serve a variety of um, geographies and um, a variety of needs and applications. So we are serving urban as well as rural um, areas, as you'll see in a couple of examples that I'll present. And we are definitely supporting governments to fulfill their, their role in um, involving their citizens in civil society with broadband networks. Next slide, please. So an example of our providing uh, the ability of, of, of our own system and of satellites generally to be able to provide very essential services to urban areas is the work that we've done with uh, mobile network operators um, to bring, uh, to do 4G backhaul and to support 4G services uh, in a variety of locations. In this instance, um, what you're seeing on the screen is um, illustrating the service that we provide in Iquitos, Peru, um, in partnership with um, an internet service provider, AccessAt. We provide um, satellite-based backhaul. This is a, a fairly remote area of Peru. I think you can see from part of the backdrop that this is very close to um, areas that are uh, rainforest and uh, hard to reach, not um, uh, well connected or, or uh, perhaps when we got there connected by fiber um, so that the, the services that can be offered are limited unless or until you can get fiber-like capacity. And that's what we've been able to deliver. You can also see that this is serving a, a significant urban area. This is Peru's sixth largest city with uh, 500,000 people. But the services that they get Will, are equivalent to what can be available in Lima. Uh, we're talking about 4G and LTE services and up to one gigabits per second per beam. Um, this is a low latency service, less than 150 millisecond. Again, able to deliver um, the quality of service that is expected when you're connected to a fiber uh, network. Um, as I also mentioned, this kind of capability is allowing cloud applications today, whether it's virtual meetings, the level of security that, that is needed to support um, uh, the applications that we are now no longer having on premises, but um, accessing through software um, and connectivity in the cloud and um, Internet of Things, powering our um, rapid transition to um, networks that can support the distribution and use of big data over uh, large areas. Next slide, please. One thing we're happy about, and I, I know that um, my colleagues would probably have a number of um, examples to share as well, is our ability as a satellite provider to be able to very rapidly deploy additional resources when they're required for example, this current situation. So our um, COVID response has involved um, also uh, serving an area that's really not far from um, the area that you just saw featured in Iquitos. And the area that we um, were able to expand service to rapidly um, in the Amazon basin is in Leticia, Colombia. It's actually a city that borders on Brazil as well as Peru. Um, this is, again, an example of serving um, not in a rural area, but serving a city to be able to uh, amplify their capacity to provide service to citizens, whether it's through um, free Wi-Fi hotspots, as, we've, as was delivered in Leticia, or to enable um, expanded services to hospitals. This connectivity was also able to be made available to um, households and businesses and to help establish e-learning or, or expand e-learning platforms for local students. Um, again, um, previous panelists have emphasized how very important it is um, and, how, and how COVID sort of illustrated that the connectivity that um, 
is available uh, sitting on top of fiber in an urban area is really needed by everyone now to be able to access platforms like the one that we're on or simply to do everyday business or very basic um, uh, activities of government like school, like um, hospitals. This is uh, not just a nice to have anymore. Our public inter internet um, has to be available um, wherever uh, citizens are, whether it's in remote areas, which we can serve, or urban areas, which um, as you've seen in these past two examples, we do serve. Uh, so um, we do need this connectivity now. Um, and, and the exciting part of this panel is seeing how very many ways we'll be able to get this uh, connectivity to populated areas around the world and to areas wherever we may be. I'll talk in a, in a bit when we get to the ITU section about eSIMs or stations in motion, um, which is very much about making sure that the kind of connectivity that we're relying on for the COVID response and for our everyday activities is available wherever people go, not where we live, uh, whether it's a remote area or a city, but wherever we go. So that's on um, airplanes, which uh, eventually we'll all be able to, uh, like it or not, um, travel uh, extensively as we have been doing by, by plane, by ship, or to conduct um, and, and go to um, places remotely we will want the same kind of connectivity that we are, we were able to uh, we're able to access now on this platform and um, in cities. Next slide, please. So um, we are expanding what we're able to do. We're very excited about the uh, beginning of the launch next year of our new Mio constellation Empower, which will very significantly enhance the, the capabilities of our already operational Mio system. Um, what we have in, in our current system is reach, but based on steerable spot beams. So these spot beams are very capable on our current constellation. They've been able to follow ships. They are very easily um, repositioned to um, meet needs or to transition needs to new areas. Uh, one of the things that has happened with our existing system is that in many areas, we've been able to make the case for, um, for fiber, basically to show that um, even if it does not look like a densely populated area, the communications needs for uh, high throughput capacity, for fiber-like capacity are there. Um, and once fiber, uh, once um, our system has, has been able to serve an area, uh, the justification for fiber, the business case for fiber can be made more, more evident. What is happening um, uh, now with Empower is that rather than just be able to um, make that case or to show or to meet the needs for high throughput capacity, fiber-like capacity um, in remote areas, in urban areas where that need is not being met. With the Empower Constellation, we'll have steerable and shapeable beams that are uh, very rapidly programmable so that that reach and that carrier grade throughput can be rapidly deployed and repositioned and um, amplified or turned down as needed um, really on a virtual real-time basis. Um, as with the current system, this will be a very high performance, low latency system. The networks owing to the ability of this, the beams to be steered and shaped and to uh, dynamically adjust power will be very dynamic and adaptive um, networks. And this will operate uh, seamlessly in a cloud enabled architecture. We will have, a, we're, we're developing um, new tools, new software to, um, to maximize our ability to switch between applications, to, to switch between um, customers or to very rapidly adjust to customers changing needs. All this is, is scalable. Um, one of the benefits of, of Mio is how easily, how um, seamlessly scalable the constellation has been. We started out with a 12 satellite constellation which we uh, rapidly decided we needed to expand with our existing MEO constellation from 12 to the current 20 satellites. Our um, originally planned seven satellites for beginning the Empower constellation has rapidly morphed into um, an 11 satellite constellation that we intend to deploy. 
And this ability to scale allows us to meet needs uh, as they grow. And, and we've only seen that growth. So we're optimistic as are the other panelists about the, the future of the Empower Constellation. Next slide, please. So this again shows kind of the progression of um, what uh, we're going to see in terms of bandwidth improvement. Um, there, there's a link to a video of how each of these networks work. As you can see on the left, we are now working with steerable beams, but on the right, uh, the graphic that you see shows that uh, what kind of connectivity we'll be able to achieve with the beams that are uh, electronically steerable and shapeable. What this will mean uh, for the delivery of service will, will mean we'll have many more user endpoints that we can uh, reach. We can improve our link budgets. We'll have much more connectivity, uh, increased flexibility. We will be able to deliver our services at a lower cost per bit and um, scale up. At this point, um, we haven't had the capacity necessarily um, to serve uh, it, the customers the way we would uh, at the scale we would we would like, and we will be scaling up quite significantly with the capabilities that we'll have with the Empower Constellation. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to um, WRC 19, just looking backwards about what we were, uh, what we've uh, been able to achieve, it has been very important uh, for our uh, medium Earth orbit system that um, we focused on Earth stations in, in motion. We've uh, got a regime in place for geostationary satellites now as a result of WRC 19 spanning um, the full bands. Um, that are, are in use typically by any typical geostationary satellite system in the Ka band. Um, and, and so that's very uh, timely with the recent rapid growth of um, deployed um, aeronautical capacity um, and maritime capacity. For Empower, what we're very uh, gratified it, to see is that we will be studying this in, in this cycle for NGSO eSIMs, there's a very strong basis for a global harmonized framework now for um, supporting um, the kind of connectivity that we're talking about, um, high throughput, low latency on aeronautical platforms and on maritime platforms or wherever we are um, serving mobile platforms. One of the things that we've been able to show as well is that we can effectively, I saw a question in the chat about being able to provide uh, the, the mechanics of providing high throughput connectivity to rapidly moving uh, aeronautical platforms. Last year, already a year ago, working with Hughes and Talus and Thincom, which produces a flat panel um, antenna uh, aeronaut for aeronautical uses, we were able to demonstrate uh, speeds um, over 250 megabits per second to that um, aeronautical platform via uh, on a, using the medium Earth orbit, using the O3B constellation, but also being able to switch from that constellation to geostationary capacity. So the ability to do that is here. Um, the, uh, the ability to close this out, uh, a global harmonized uh, regulatory framework for eSIMs on non-geostationary satellites in the coming cycle uh, couldn't be more important. Um, also important, and this is something that uh, Mario mentioned specifically, is um, the, the use of the QV bands. Uh, we're, we're now all going to be intensively using KA band, and um, we are talking about very high throughput capacity in an era where we're only thinking of ways to use um, our, our spectrum and capacity more efficiently based on growing demand. So we uh, we all in the satellite in industry very much have our eye on uh, the ways that the QV band can help us manage this intense uh, growth in capacity in the use of capacity that we're expecting to see. We were, for the same reason, we were very happy to see that additional spectrum is being allocated to the fixed satellite service. And um, also that uh, now that we are all actively uh, deploying additional um, new constellations, that there's a very clear framework for commercial systems in terms of bringing into use of our systems and the milestones for um, rolling them out. Next slide, slide, please. 
So I've mentioned um, how important um, eSIMs are and that uh, and how important it is that that's being studied in this cycle for non-geostationary satellite systems. Uh, again, this is um, something now that we have uh, great commercial experience with already in the market. We have a very solid framework um, based on the uh, geostationary studies and, and understanding of moving forward. And, and so this is a very important um, course of study over the next, uh, over this study cycle. Um, SCS is also very interested in the developments that will be taking place in studying satellite to satellite links. What we see in terms of the importance of these links is um, there have been a lot of questions about um, intersatellite links uh, being used by constellations. But um, our interest in this has been um, linked to the future of Internet of Things, the future of um, small satellites, for example. What we're seeing is that as there is um, a variety of constellations and also a variety of applications that is all about aggregating data, whether it is um, small satellites um, doing imaging to be able to accurately and in real time track um, um, agricultural um, uh, track farms uh, to see how crops are, are growing, that kind of agricultural application, um, or Internet of Things, the way that um, networks are being architected is we'll have uh, all these devices aggregating all this data and they'll need to go to a central point or they can be gathered, uh, this data can be gather, gathered on the edge of the network to aggregate data that can be useful locally in managing local environments using the data that is gathered from um, devices connected to the Internet of Things. All this means that that data needs to be aggregated around the world and rapidly distributed back to where the business that is using it is, is deploying that information or um, aggregated for um, analysis anywhere around the world. But that, that not all of the systems that are gathering this data necessarily have the kind of um, global infrastructure or you, you don't want to rely solely on a, a fiber infrastructure to get this data to where it needs to be. So these satellite, satellite links are going to be a really important um, element in being able to get data, um, making sure there's a very clear regulatory framework for operations that are already being conceived of and, they're in, and significant efforts to sort of commercially implement the use of satellites to backhaul um, all kinds of data. Again, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it is images, um, we, we really are, are seeing a, a very strong need for this. So you'll see uh, SCS active and, and engaged on this particular agenda item. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, you know, for us, um, the NGSO constellations are a really important element of um, accelerating the deployment of 4G and um, 5G. Um, SES has a company that is heavily invested and is, is really um, exploiting to the full extent the ability of a multi-orbit um, constellation to adapt a particular application to a particular need or the right application to the right need. Um, we see um, this uh, development of NGSO constellations <laughs> as making a very much stronger um, uh, seamless data network. Our, our legacy data networks are going to have to um, rapidly upgrade, deploy, um, expand, as we've seen based on the needs that are uh, communications needs, connectivity needs that we've seen uh, growing or, or just laid bare by the pandemic. So our ability to serve hard to serve areas and underserved areas, again, whether it's uh, urban or remote, has, has never been um, so clear. And um, SES, again, with um, a multi-orbit constellation and the ability to provide this connectivity at a, at a multiplicity of, of levels um, is really excited about um, where this part of the industry is going. Um, the panelists have all made very clear how uh, very large, uh, significant the investments are in this new sector. 
Um, this is not just for the space side, this is for the ground segment as well. And um, for our part, um, we are, we continue to innovate and this panel is just another example of how, how that innovation has been um, brought to bear to bring a whole new dimension to the satellite sector. Um, that has included for, for SES being um, one of the first to really um, in, uh, invest in, uh, in our uh, partner in launching SpaceX um, and is evident by what many of the panelists have been um, outlining in terms of the use of steerable and shapeable beams in terms of uh, their use of eSIMs. Um, so we're looking forward to more of that in the future. And um, what we all need for this, and I, I'm sure we'll get to this, is um, we will need reliable access to, to spectrum. One of the things that has been talked about in terms of spectrum sharing is um, the ability of particularly gateway facilities to uh, share spectrum, particularly um, uh, in the multi-service environment that we're in. But I think it's important to emphasize that these are going to be ubiquitous services. And so there are going to be uh, places where we will need um, access to spectrum that's dedicated exclusively to satellite. We are sharing very intensively among ourselves at the moment in, a, in the geostationary environment. And um, we as, as an operational system are engaged with all the folks on the panel in how in the future we're going to be sharing in this multi-NGSO environment. We're very excited about it. Um, and we, um, it, it, we, we shouldn't fail to mention that the ITU is playing a very important role in that. That process is, um, is, very, is tried and true. Um, we, there has been a lot of give and take between us and the other operators in, in this, and I'm sure that's going on between the operators on this panel. Um, we're sharing the same frequencies. Um, we're sharing multiple orbits, even in the non-geostationary environment. And uh, the ITU process for us um, is still the very best way to manage this uh, process globally. So uh, again, thanks to you to the ITU for inviting us and um, uh, thanks to the other panelists for uh, sharing so much about your systems today. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, this is a very nice conclusion that I completely share. <laughs> um, I noticed that we are quite uh, uh, advanced in the schedule. Maybe what I would suggest is that we conclude by answering one question uh, that was in fact, uh, um, that could uh, be relevant for each of the uh, systems. And this is, um, as, a, uh, as an, in your experience, either operating a satellite system or a non-GSO system or planning to operate one, what is the most important policy steps that a regulator can take to ensure that your system can deploy uh, its services quickly to the citizens of uh, the, the regulator's country. So what would be the, the most important policy decision they can, they can take? Uh, I will go in the reverse order. Maybe I will start with Suzanne and uh, go, uh, go up to Patricia. Thanks, Alexander. Um, what, uh, one of the things we've been talking about is in, on this panel since we're talking about WRC is uh, re harmonization of regulatory frameworks and policies across regions. Um, this has really helped. So the ITU's role in frequency harmonization and developing uh, regulatory frameworks has, has helped us. Um, not every country has resources to be able to manage um, it very easily the processing of our requests um, to, or for licensing when it's a brand new service, um, you, whether it's brand new bands or just um, an unfamiliar technology. So the ITU's role in um, being able to develop policies uh, like ESIM in the area of ESIMs or stations in, motions, in motion and other areas has been really important. Um, what markets themselves can do that really helps us to roll out quickly once we're able to uh, get our satellites launched and in operation, uh, is that we've found the most ease of access when markets have fully articulated policies and processes for VSAT licensing. Uh, that's, I think, where we've seen the, the fastest market access and rollout. 
We were also able to, as a, over the years we've seen that we, we are most easily able to deploy where there is dedicated spectrum for uh, fixed satellite use, fixed satellite service use, and, and where the regulator is prepared for VSAT licensing, for, uh, whether it's blanket licensing, whether it is eSIMS, or just generally ubiquitous uh, fixed satellite service deployment. We're a technology that is able to reach the full territory of nations and um, the ability to deploy multiple user, user terminals um, is, is really important. So where governments have had those frameworks in place, um, we've had um, ease of access. It, it's also important that governments are prepared, especially with non-geostationary constellations that will have more in, in user um, equipment associated directly with those networks to be able to have policies that um, allow for um, very clear certification of equipment or, or what qualifies as certified and very clear ability to import equipment um, that can slow the speed of delivery of service. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. So going to Ruth, for OneWeb, what would be the most important policy steps that a regulator can take to ease the deployment of uh, these non-GSO systems? Yeah, thanks. First, I want to echo and agree with Suzanne 100%. Global harmonization is a prerequisite because these technologies, this technology is global, maybe for the first time ever. I think that satellites in general um, uh, ha have made regulators around the world struggle with what they perceive as perhaps a bit of loss of control, right? So one satellite covers not only their country, but neighboring countries and, and a wider region. And how do you, um, how do you control um, and, and make sure that your communications are secure, whatever concerns you have about that, um, while allowing, allowing access uh, to, to your markets, right, these satellites. So now we have uh, uh, constellations that are licensed uh, via one nation at the ITU. And the other 199 nations want to be sure um, that, that their communications are secure and safe. And so I applaud the ITU. I'm grateful to the ITU. Um, all of these systems have, have pointed out how they're using the KA band, the 28 gigahertz band. I'm grateful to the ITU for to recognizing <clears throat> Um, that this is where these new satellites are going. And so those countries that are not harmonizing, that are going their own way, that's a big difficulty. That is a big difficulty for a, for a global technology. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the recognition by these countries that their regulations may have been written uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, under a, 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 a regime of what I would now call traditional geostationary satellites, one satellite, one antenna, that was the whole system. Um, and um, the recognition that we are now talking hundreds if not thousands of satellites um, and tens if not hundreds of earth stations, which may have more than one antenna, and it might not be in your country, but that doesn't mean that you can't have control, that you can't feel secure about the communications with your consumers, with your users. And so, that flexibility to recognize that the regulations might need to be reworded um, is important to enable these new technologies. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, um, and now look, going to Mario. Mario, you, 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 tell, you told us your wish list for ITU, but um, what would be your preferred wish uh, in terms of uh, national regulators? What should they... What should they do in priority in your view for, for allowing uh, Telesat to deploy quicker? Sure. Um, I, I will try not to repeat what uh, Susanna and Ruth have said that I uh, fully share. And probably my, in my previous life, like others in this panel, I worked for a national regulator. In, in my view, for a, satellite comp for a global satellite company, it's important to have uh, national licenses around to be able to work. Uh, so in my view, what is important for a national regulator is trying to cut the red tape in order to get the national license, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, to, make, to 
uh, to have a, a regulatory regime that favors satellite and does not favor other services. Uh, light touch regulatory regime can also be used for uh, protecting other services that are sharing the same bands. And that, that would be definitely the top, uh, one of the top uh, things I would put in my wish list for national policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie, uh, what would be your, uh, uh, your advice for national regulators? What should they do first? Thank you, Alexander. I too feel that harmonization of spectrum regulatory frameworks for non-GSOs is vitally important. And I will say that that includes both fixed and mobility applications which seem to be more of a challenge for regulators than, than fixed applications. And as far as the ITU is concerned, creating an enabling mindset where we have approach the introduction of new technologies and um, the evolution of innovation such that we're focused on allowing them to enter the marketplace and to enter the community of solutions for providing broadband to people who need it is so important that we use real parameters, we use rational protection criteria, and we get to a, a yes answer. Thanks. Thank you very much. And finally, Patricia, now that you have more than 700 satellites in orbit, <laughs> I'm sure you have some idea about what is, in your view, the main priority that regulators uh, should consider uh, to, to facilitate the deployment of non-GSO systems. So they've gotten great wise advice from my, my colleagues and friends on the panel. I think the one thing I would say to a national regulator is be clear on what you're hoping to accomplish. If you're trying to increase broadband, then start from the bottom with the consumer and the end user. What do you want them to do? Uh, make sure that you've got a way for that um, device, whether whatever it's called by whatever provider it is, um, to clearly be certified. Try and look at um, regional certifications and standardization um, to try and make that faster. Look at look to make sure you've got a way to authorize multiple terminals because you're hoping to connect lots of different sites. So blanket licensing is a great tool that's been approached by lots of regulators. Um, and then I would look at the, um, the frequency bands that you would use at a consumer. For us, it's KU band, I think from OneWeb2. The others would be KA band. Understand who the other users are and what parameters we need to um, observe to, be, uh, to use those frequencies that are allocated to us and, um, and the adjacent services. For the gateways, I think those are those are almost always individually licensed, site by site, and um, there are lots of little tricks and steps. I'd second Mario's comment about um, looking at the red tape. How do you get from selecting a site to getting it authorized? Um, those are all things that take time. Every, everyone on this panel is working hard to bring kind of the space capability to reaching broadband service provision. And um, you know we're we're glad to have real customers using us right now and um, hoping to grow that. But uh, each step in that regulatory process can add time to when a customer can actually make use of it. And if anything, right now I think all of us are inventive companies. Um, we're all driving hard towards this. But uh, as Julie mentioned, I think the pandemic is underscoring the urgency for us to move fast. Um, so for uh, national regulators do an inventory from the from what you want the sort of objective you set from the customer site all the way up that's what i would recommend and i think regulators are doing that we're hearing from around the world um, that these these times are um, prompting streamlining so that's that's terrific thank you thank you very much uh, i think that's a nice uh, uh, conclusion that uh, we should uh, we, we should really focus on the consumer needs and uh, the, uh, our fellow citizens' needs to, to get access to the internet. This is certainly one of the most uh, important uh, objectives that ITU has set uh, to, to provide uh, connectivity to the, to the world. I uh, just would like to, to end this uh, nice uh, webinar with showing you the result of the polls that we have uh, been doing. 
uh, during the, the, the webinar, uh, we, we ask uh, three questions. Uh, in uh, your view, how dominant will non so large uh, uh, constellations issue will be during the next uh, study cycle and next WRC 23? Most of you answered as prominent as during WRC 19. <coughs> so, what is the main challenge for satellite operators planning to deploy non GSO system? Uh, most of you answered the coordination among non GSO systems just before funding. <coughs> And finally, do you think that non-GSO constellations aim at providing uh, broadband connectivity and those targeting the IoT market could share the same spectrum? And the, the main answer, the majority uh, answered, why not? But under certain conditions aiming at addressing the network heterogeneity. We have received in the Q&A a lot of um, questions about IoT systems. This was not really the focus of this webinar. But uh, the number of questions has made us uh, aware of the interest of the topic as well. And so we may uh, plan a further ITU satellite webinars in 2021 addressing specifically the topic of IoT. Uh, but by concluding, I would like to thank the five panelists. Uh, I think you provided us a very uh, good overview of the current situation for non-GSO satellite broadband uh, systems. And uh, I was very glad to hear the various views and your various um, uh, approach to, to the market. So I would like to, to thank you uh, <coughs> uh, on behalf of the ITU. I'm sure that we will uh, meet uh, with uh, many pa participants uh, that were uh, online. And um, I would like to, to conclude by remembering uh, people that we will uh, host a third episode of the ITU satellite webinars on 11th of November. Take care, it will be uh, one hour uh, earlier than usual. And this will be dedicated to GSO satellites um, so that to, so to have a complete picture of the uh, space ecosystem. So I would like to thank you again and uh, I wish you a good day, a good night, a good end of the day. <laughs> <coughs> and stay safe and see you hopefully sometime somewhere in uh, an ITU meetings, um, probably not this year, but maybe next year. See you and bye-bye. Uh,